Good evening, everyone. I'm Indre Viscontis. I'm the resident neuroscientist at the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. I sing and direct operas, so it's my job tonight to tell you how music works in 10 minutes or less. <laughs> so there's a lot to cover. So with a background as a memory researcher, I know it's a lot easier to remember a story than a bunch of facts. So let's start with a story, that of arguably the greatest composer of all time, whose birthday, 250 years ago, we are celebrating this year. So let's use his biography as a scaffold on which we can hook ideas about how the brain turns sound into music and the relationship between dyslexia and music. Ludwig von Beethoven has said that music comes to me more readily than words, and it was thought that he had dyslexia. He's considered the greatest composer of his era and possibly of all time. He was frequently abused as a child, forced to practice, berated, and so he grew up an angry, sullen young man. His technique was not great. Composing was a struggle for him. Yet he almost single-handedly pulled us from the classical era into the romantic era. What separates these two eras? Arguably a shift from reason to emotion. The classical era celebrated reason, the age of enlightenment, and Beethoven embodied classical discipline throughout his life. Quoting one of his biographers, he had a classical need for form and organization, but at the same time, a romantic bigness of imagination, which constantly bent these forms. His music now is known for its emotional power, a revolution of expressiveness. So what about his music moves us? What about any music moves us? Well, it's not in the sound waves, because the same sounds can be noise in one context and sublime music in another. It's not in the marks on the page, because they're not meaningful until someone actually plays them for us. So music isn't music until your brain makes it so until it finds meaning in the sound patterns that moves you. As this piece by John Cage famously proves, <laughs> for four minutes and 33 seconds, the music is listening to musicians of any kind sit silently. And it's a powerful piece of music. So how does our brain pull meaning from sound? If I had to distill the brain down into one sentence, I would say its job is to predict the future. Because if we know what's coming, then we can adjust our behavior so that we can survive to reproduce another day. We recognize patterns in every one of our senses. And these patterns gravitate towards those that are meaningful to us. The biggest modifiers of human behavior are other humans. So we see human faces or human attributes even in the most abstract visual stimuli. We'll search for meaning, even in the most banal things, but in music, meaning is everywhere in the patterns. The patterns are hierarchical. The patterns are overly represented in every aspect of music. Multiple layers of meaning embedded in patterns of sound. If we're listening to music and speech, we see a lot of overlap in the parts of the brain that are involved. Parts of the brain, including the frontal cortex, parts of which Virginia will talk about, and the temporal cortex, where we have our memories stored and our concepts as well. But what about when we're producing music and speech? Here, too, we see a lot of overlap. So when you look at the brains uh, activated by individuals who are speaking versus sitting in silence, or singing versus sitting in silence, they look remarkably similar. And when we directly compare singing versus speaking, what we see is a higher density of heat, that's a measure of statistical power here, in the right hemisphere. So there's more activity in the right hemisphere when we are singing versus when we are speaking. And that makes a lot of sense when we consider how much emotion, how much meaning is in, a, in, a, in speech. I mean, I, you know, I have two kids. They ha are very good at manipulating us, and they're very good at imbuing their speech with meaning. So, you know, my son will say, please, please, mama, you need to buy me that Lego set. Please. And I know there's a lot of meaning in it. I'm going to step away from the mic because if I sing it, it has a whole other added layer. 
Luckily, he can't sing yet. Um, <laughs> so I just want to give an overview of these emotional pathways in music, because there too, we see that there are multiple ways in which emotion is represented in the brain when it comes to music. So for example, there's a direct link between what we hear and our evolutionarily ancient emotional network, the limbic system. There's also a connection between our body movement and what we hear in music. In fact, we don't see the rhythm. We feel the beat. It's almost impossible to understand music without feeling intrinsically what it is, uh, how it is that your body is being moved by that music. And then the spine-tingling emotional reactions to music, the chills, are part of a third pathway that tags rewarding experiences with activation of our autonomic nervous system, our gut feelings, if you will. But not only do we have these multiple networks and multiple pathways involved, but they also fluctuate with the tempo of music. Here's a video from a study that shows that the brain activity matches what we are hearing in terms of the tempo. but we feel what we hear. In fact, the way in which we can understand what another musician is expressing, especially for musicians, is by mirroring in our own brains what is happening, the activity that is happening in their brains. So we see, again, motor cortex activated, and we see the insula, which is a part of our brain that is involved in monitoring our own awareness of our own bodies. So, I just want to point out that these networks, that these areas, are in regions that are involved in theory of mind, in being able to empathize with others, and emotional understanding. And so when we empathize with, with the musicians that we hear, we literally put our brains in their brains. But we not only sync our, our brain activities, we also sync much of our bo other body rhythms. Um, we know that when you sing in a choir, your heart rate sinks, your respiration rate sinks. It's hard not to match that beat. And this is something that we actually learn to do better and better as we become trained in music. Uh, so this is actually an image from an MEG study uh, of looking at how brain waves are synchronizing to a Beethoven sonata. And what you'll notice is that the musicians at the top are a little bit better than the non-musicians, but that's because this Beethoven sonata is slow. And it takes time to understand the patterns in a slow piece of music compared with a fast paced piece of music. But even if you're not a musician, you still show a lot of synchrony. So that gets us back to Beethoven. Beethoven's work shows that he could write long and complex themes, but that he preferred to break them into pieces. Motifs sometimes as short as only two notes. He would then layer these foundational bricks, one on top of each other, to build up a cathedral of sound. That's why architects like Frank Lloyd Wright and Louis Kahn loved his music. They perhaps were responding to his spatial sense, as if he composed in three dimensions. Yet numbers were difficult for him. He couldn't multiply. He couldn't divide. He transposed digits when writing dates. He struggled with music theory. But his solutions to the contrapuntal pro problems that he posed for himself belie a different mathematical ability, almost a kind of high-level calculus. If freedom was Beethoven's objective, he found it by bending rules, altering the ancient sonata form into something new, bearing his soul in entirely new musical expressions, new melodies, new combinations. His music could be sublimely simple, 
but he seemed to relish in the struggle, manipulating music like a sculptor works with clay. In fact, we recently unearthed one of his manuscripts, the Grosse Fugue, and composing, you can see, was a physical labor for Beethoven. He, he has these, these wax markings and, and the, the pen he put through, through his pages. So I just want to end with um, a little excerpt from one of his contemporary biographers. His intellectual profundity and range were immense, but he was incredibly slow. He had infinite difficulty in learning counterpoint and blamed Haydn for not teaching him properly. The truth is that Haydn gave him all the hints, but they did not penetrate Beethoven's stout cranium. He could not grasp their significance in the theory of music, just as in arithmetic, he had to scratch rows of twos on the wall to count to 22. Could not multiply. Even his simplest melodies cost him endless labor. In everything, he was astonishing, astonishingly slow, but astonishingly sure. He grew steadily in artistic power, in power of expression, of rearing imposing structures, of inventing new types of ornamental sound patterns. So enough talk. Let's listen to Beethoven's septet as performed by the faculty and students of the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. 